Okay, so we're going to be talking about the ovarian reserve and its role in menopause. So firstly, what is the ovarian reserve? Well, individuals, females, unlike males who produce sperm for all their life, women are born with a set number of follicles. As you can see here, prenatally you have about 6 million, but by the time you're born, you only have about a million left. And because through life you go through your cycles and you have menstruation and uh, you have ovulation and atresia, this number is going to slowly decline with age. And normally people go through menopause about 51, and this is when you've reached about a thousand or less eggs. So, how could we, what biomarkers exist that enable us to test whether someone is about to go through menopause or what are the biomarkers of menopause? So, one of the obvious ones might be well, how much FSH you're producing. So, obviously, when you're in the pre-menopause stage, stage, you have plenty of follicles and you're producing lots of estrogen and inhibin. And of course, estrogen is having a negative feedback of both the hypothalamus and pituitary and inhibin would just have a, your negative feedback at the FSH level, so just at the pituitary level. And because you've got this negative feedback, you're going to have a decrease in the amount of FSH. But of course, as you age and you go through atresia, you're going to have less follicles. And with these less follicles, you're going to have, obviously, a lower ovarian reserve, which is what less follicles mean, and you're going to have less granulosa cells. Therefore, you're going to produce less estrogen and less inhibin, which is going to mean less negative feedback upon your hypothalamus pituitary or your HPG axis, which is going to result in a high amount of FSH. So let's look at these graphs. This is, of course, a woman going through her normal cycle, and this is for a woman who has gone through menopause. And as you, as you can see here, you have a high amount of FSH. FSH is represented in red. And this is exactly what we've shown here. You have a high amount of FSH and you have a decreasing amount of estrogen, which is, woo, sorry, which is also what we've shown here. And of course, so you might say, well, perhaps a way we could test if a woman is going through menopause is by testing their FSH levels. And of course, a reason why this isn't the best biomarker for doing so is because look at a woman during her normal cycle. FSH fluctuates. And therefore, because it fluctuates, it's not going to be a good biomarker. What we want is something stable. And to get something stable, we preferably want something that isn't related to the HPG axis. And that's when anti-malarian um, hormone comes into play. So anti-malarian hormone... I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. If you've been around for a while, or if you've studied biology in the past, you know that this is released in males so that the Muller, because the Mullerian uh, ducks are what are going to become your fallopian tube, and the Wolfian ducks are going to become your, um, what are they going to become? Your vas deferens, I believe. And anyway, you don't need to know this. It's something to, involved with sex differentiation, but it's also important to know that it's produced postnatally in females within the ovaries, and specifically, it's produced in your uh, granul. Oh, sorry, it's produced in the granulosa cells of your small antral, your preantral, your primary follicles. It's not produced within the larger follicles. And the reason why it's a useful biomarker for us is because it's constant. It doesn't fluctuate with age or through a cycle. And also importantly, as we've shown here, it's connected to the amount of preantral and primary follicles. So let's now go to this graph. And this graph shows our primordial follicles in red, our growing follicles in blue. And this line here represents the amount of our AMH levels, the serum AMH. And as you can see, this line is pretty well connected to these bars. So this tells us that as you age, this is for mice, all right? That's why they're such low, you know, 18 months. People, humans don't go through menopause at 18 months, obviously. This is obviously for mice. And as you can see, AMH decreases with age. And this decrease is because you're getting a decrease in your primordial follicles. So this tells us that a good indicator of the amount of primordial follicles you have, and remember that your ovarian reserve is the amount of primordial follicles you have, so a good indicator of the amount of primordial follicles you have is your AMH levels. So therefore, if you want to know if you're about to go through menopause or if you're in menopause, and what you're going to find is a lot of IVF clinics are going to do a lot of testing of your AMH levels. So 
In this presentation, we're going to be asking two questions. How does AMH affect follicles and what regulates AMH? So let's begin with that first question. What affects AMH? And to answer this question, we're going to be focusing on a specific study by Pellet 2011. I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And basically, he took ovaries from some women who underwent a hysterectomy. He isolated the granulosa cells, and he specifically only selected those follicles that were less than 10 millimeters. As we noted before, if we go back here, whoa, it is only within the small follicles that AMH is going to produ be produced. So that's why he prefers those to any other, because he's specifically testing AMH. So now that he's got his relevant follicles, he's going to divide them into three groups, one group, two group, three groups. The control group is not going to receive any treatment. The second group is only going to be exposed to FSH, and the third group is going to be exposed to FSH and AMH. And this third group is actually split up into uh, three other groups, uh, one that is exposed to 220 and 200 nanograms of milliliter of AMH. And then what they're going to test from each of these groups is the ratio of expression of aromatase and beta-actin and FSH receptor and beta-actin. So the first question is, well, what on earth is beta-actin? Beta-actin is something produced in almost every cell which is involved with cell structure and is highly conserved. So it provides a good base level for uh, expression of a um, protein. So it just provide that's the only reason they're using it. It provides a good constant base measure to test it against something else. So that's why it's being used. Anyway, so we're testing, if you don't understand this beta-actin business, don't worry about it. We're testing how much aromatase mRNA is being produced and how much FS, FSH receptors are being produced. And the reason why we're concerned with aromatase and FSH receptors is because obviously aromatase is involved with estrogen production and FSH receptors are involved with FSH sensitivity. And of obviously the more estrogen you're producing and the more sensitive you are to FSH, the more follicles that are, are going to be recruited and are going to grow. So after they had done all their treatments, they incubated the cells, they cut open the cell, took out the mRNA, and then ran it through what we call a real-time quantitative PCR um, with cyber green probes. You're thinking, what on earth is that? Well, let me explain. So we all know what PCR is. You denature the enzyme. And this, just so you know, is our aromatase gene. You denature the enzyme. So they two strands split apart. You put in your primers relevant to the aromatase gene area. And then obviously you get your nucleotides beginning to bind. Now cyber green is fluorescent, so we can see it, and it binds to the relevant aromatase gene area. So this enables us to quantify how much aromatase gene is being produced by each treatment group. And obviously we're going to do the same thing for FSH receptor genes as well. So this enables us to test how much mRNA are we producing in each treatment group, and we can see it because this cyber green probe is going to emit fluorescence. So now let's look at the results. So as you can see here, if we only expose them, so this was treatment group two, if we only expose it to FSH only, we get a lot of aromatase being produced. But if we co-treat FSH with differing levels of AMH, look how much it shrinks down. We're only going to get a little bit of aromatase being produced. Similarly, for FSH receptors, we're going to get a lot produced for FSH only. But when we co-treat this with AMH, it's going to decrease significantly. So what does all this tell us? Well, it tells us that when we have high amounts of AMH, it's going to reduce the FSH sensitivity of granulosa cells, or if you want, of the follicle. So we're going to have less estrogen because aromatase is involved with estrogen production, we're going to be less sensitive to FSH, and therefore less follicles are going to be recruited, and less follicles are going to grow. This is a complicated issue, so I've made this pretty little graph. Well, not graph. What is this? Whatever it is. And as you can see, you've got your ovarian reserve. And if we expose it to a high, expose our ovarian reserve to a high amount of AMH, we're going to get low recruitment. Because as we've shown previously, if you have high amounts of AMH, you're going to get low recruitment and less of them growing. And getting low recruitment is good because only one of these cells, is follicles, is going to be uh, chosen for ovulation. 
and the rest are going to be are going to go through atresia. So when you have a high amount of AMH, you're going to have low amounts of atresia. So your ovarian reserve is going to be retained. When you have a low amount of AMH, right, you're going to have a high amount of recruitment because you, as you saw, when you've only exposed something to FSH only, you're going to have a high amount of FSH receptors and a high amount of estrogen. So a lot of them are going to be selected for recruitment. And you know what that means? A lot of them are going to die. And that means you're going to deplete your ovarian reserve very quickly because you're going to get high atresia. So that's how AMH affects follicles. It decreases FSH sensitivity. All right, so we've answered this question now. So now we're going to ask, what regulates AMH? What regulates it? And specifically for this issue, we're going to be focusing in on premature ovarian failure, which I'm going to call POF. What is POF? POF is individuals, well, women, who have low amounts, uh, have a low number of ovarian reserve. The ovarian reserve is low. They don't have many follicles left. They go through menopause quicker. So at a young age, they're going to go through menopause. And many people have noted that women who go through an early menopause have a mutation on the FOXL2 gene. The FOXL2 gene is a crazy gene. I can't get into all of it now, but it is very interesting. So based on what I've previously told you, we know that having uh, early exhaustion of your ovarian reserve is linked to low AMH production. Park et al. said, well, maybe having a low AMH production is associated with the FOXL2 gene. All right, let's keep this in mind, and now let's go through Park et al.'s uh, study. And before we do that, I just want to talk about the experimental techniques he used. So firstly, he used a knockdown of the FOXL2 gene. Now you're probably thinking, what's knockdown? Well, perhaps you've heard of knockout. A knockout gene is when we silence a specific segment of the DNA. Knockdown is when we silence mRNA by using small interfering RNAs. If you don't get this point, it doesn't matter. All you need to know is that we're going to silence the FOXL2 gene in one of our treatment groups. The other uh, techniques we're going to use is we're going to take AMH and FOXL2 genes and put them into a plasmid and then inject this plasmid into a granulosa cell. So here are our plasmids, our FOXL2 plasmid, and here is our AMH plasmid. And our last point is that we're actually going to insert a reporter into our AMH plasmid. Now this reporter is going to produce luciferase. Now luciferase is fluorescent. So basically, whenever AMH is activated and AMH is going to be produced, it's going to produce luciferase. And this is of course going to help us. It's going to allow us to quantify the amount of times AMH is activated because luciferase is going to be produced. And we can see luc luciferase because it's fluorescent. Hopefully that made sense. If it didn't, hopefully this will clarify it. So we have three treatment groups. The first treatment group is going to be injected with AMH plasmid, as you can see here. And we're going to couple that with a knockdown of the FOXL2 gene through the insertion of a small interfering RNA. And then what happened when we did this is that we have a low production of luciferase. We don't have much luciferase being produced when we have a knockdown of FOXL2 gene. So what does that tell us? That tells us the FOXL2 gene is a regulator of AMH. How can we confirm this result? Well, in the next group, not only do we insert an AMH plasmid, but on top of that, we insert a FOXL2 plasmid at 100 nanograms. And what we notice is that we have an increase in the amount of luciferase being produced. And then our final group, we insert even more plasmids into our uh, granulosa cell, this time 150 nanograms, and we see an even greater production of luciferase. All of this is represented on this table here. And as you, as you can see, here we have AMH luciferase activity. And we have a very low activity in our knockdown, FOXL2 knockdown. We have a low activity. But when we start increasing the amount of FOXL2 in our genes, sorry, in our granulosa cells, when we increase the amount of plasmids with FOXL2 we're injecting, we see an increase, a significant increase in our AMH luciferase activity. Now, if you remember, at the beginning, we discussed premature ovarian failure and how people, women with FOXL2 mutations, uh, people, sorry, people with POF have mutations on their FOXL2. So basically, this study wanted to investigate that as well. So they basically did the same study again, 
and they put in the wild type, so the normal FOXL2 gene, into the granulosa cells, but this time they also inserted plasmids with a mutated FOXL2 gene. As you can see here, these are all mutations that individuals with POF have. And they're just at different locations and mutated in different ways. And as you can see here, A and B represent significant. There's no significant difference between this group, this group being your knockdown mice, knockdown FOXL2 gene, and your other, and your mutated versions of FOXL2. And of course, you've got your increase. And this increase, of course, is just what we've seen here. When you've put in your normal FOXL2 gene, plasmid, into the granulosa cell, you're going to get an increase in AMH luciferase. But when you put in a plasmid with a mutated FOXL2 gene, you're not going to see any difference between these mutated versions of the plasmid and the knockdown of the FOXL2 gene. This again is a complicated uh, issue, so let me visualize it for you. So if you have a mutated FOXL2 gene, you're going to have low activation of your AMH gene, which means you're going to have low amounts of AMH being produced and these low amounts of AMH are going to act on your ovarian reserve, and because you have low, uh, sorry, because you have low AMH acting on your ovarian reserve, that's going to result in a higher sensitivity to FSH, and therefore you're going to get, which we noted before, right? So you're going to get a high amount of recruited follicles. One is going to be selected. The rest are going to die, you're going to get high atresia and early exhaustion of your ovarian reserve. And this is what happens with people with POF. Okay, let's summarize all we've learned today. So we began, well, just now we've learned what regulates AMH. And what regulates AMH is the FOXL2 gene. So how can we use this for future research? Well, individuals who want to check if they have POF could come in and we could double check them for this mutation. So this would allow diagnosis. And in addition, because we know how AMH, we know that AMH decreases FHA sensitivity, we could treat it. And recent research is starting to use stem cells in order to change the reception of aromatase and FSH. And that concludes this presentation.